affected by the natural world and by the apparent uselessness of leftover pro products. And through design, she explores our ambiguous relationship we humans foster towards animals as the source of our food and our materials. Hello. So nice to have you here. Welcome, Julia Lohman. Hello. So what can design do? Um, I wanted to start as usual. Oops, there. Um, I start all my presentations with this slide. I can't start them with any other slide because I love the moment that the audience looks at the animal and the animals back at the audience and because it's really the, at the basis of um, my work. I believe design can be immensely powerful because everything we make is designed. So we shape not only the world around us, but we also shape um, what people aspire to. We shape everything about people. You're, you're born as um, a being that doesn't really know who, who it is. And then everything else is shaped by design. We're really shaped by this world. Um, and I believe that if design uses that agency not just to support the status quo, but to question it and to deliberately move it maybe slightly in another direction or in the direction that is more sustainable and, and uh, more future uh, proof, um, then it has an immense power. My own personal way of trying to do that um, is to connect the objects that we have around us with their origin. I believe access, um, Access to basics is the subject in which I'm speaking. And I believe um, we've gained a lot of access in the last 50 years through design to kind of to objects and to, um, to allow us to um, have things. So, so things have become cheaper, uh, they've become accessible, but with this came a big problem for us. Um, we've lost somehow the connection to things, with global production, with um, really complex um, modified objects, we forgot where they come from. And my uh, inspiration came from working in Iceland on a horse and sheep farm. And I realized that there, the connection from um, the animal to the meat on your plate is really honest and really short. It's a short link. You realize that if you want to eat meat, you have to um, breed sheep, um, slaughter them in the next village, and they land on your plate. When I came back to London, I realized that there was a gap, that there was a break in, um, in the understanding that, uh, of, of the consequences of what you use um, of where it comes from. So I designed, um, I started designing um, a number of objects that take this break and that try to eliminate it. So this, for example, is a ceiling of 50 sheep stomachs that I created um, to really question why we um, are able or are happy to eat the meat of the animal and why we place the skin on top of our skin but when it comes to the stomach we bulk in horror and we say wow the stomach is disgusting there's absolutely no logic to us taking one part of the animal and valuing it and really thinking it's it's amazing and then taking another part and discarding it and not seeing its value um, sometimes you then have to take the material out of its considered out of its normal context to make um, to make it visible how much value is inherent in the material. Um, this is the close up. What happens usually when I show these um, pieces is that people are amazed by the beauty, and then there is a moment when they have it in their hand and they see, "Wow, what is this?" Oh, and I'm always really worried that they drop it because they realize it's a stomach. But there's nothing more disgusting about a stomach than about the meat of the animal. I believe there is a lot of value in the things that surround us that we don't necessarily see. And I believe that design can show us that value, that design can make us see things in a different light. Um, we went down the Thames and there, um, in low tide there are lots of 
beaches, the Thames beaches become exposed. And we walked down them and we found an amazing um, amount of bones and old Victorian bottles. And the bones had been in the river for over a hundred years because they were one of the few things that the Victorians actually discarded. There's no other rubbish because all the old linen were collected, all the old metal was collected and reused. Everything was reused apart from a few old bottles, um, a few bits of clay pipes and these old bones. So we, we as my husband and me working together, um, decided to... Um, to take these bones and to make them into really valuable objects to show what is already there and to show that, to, to give access to the value of these things. I really wonder why people make things in ivory or in really expensive materials if we have these beautiful polish, polishable surfaces that we then at the same time throw into the river. These bones are filled with the sediment of, of the Thames and therefore they have this dark color that's uh, more akin to wood or, or semi-precious stone. This is probably the best known of my pieces. Um, it goes back to this animal idea, to, to the disconnection between um, the animal we kill, the material we make from it, and the object we make from the material. And I decided to make a leather couch, a sofa that's really normal to be made in leather, um, but to make it in such a way, in such a design, that it actually links back to the origin, links back to the animal that was killed to make it. This cow is called Antonia. Um, it's upholstered with the leather of exactly one cow, exactly spaced um, spine on spine, and I select a leather that has all the wrinkles and all the markings that are normally cut out. Normal couches, leather couches, use the heights of six or eight cows because they cut out all the traces of the animal's life to disconnect it, to really make it something else. And, um, and I decided to use this and to go against this and to make a memento mori for the cow that died to create that piece of design. I made 20 cows so far. They all have, um, they all have passports. They all have different names. I hand sculpted each of them. Um, and... What's interesting is I, I sometimes get asked, oh, but this is really elitist. It's um, being sold in galleries and um, really expensive. How do you feel about this, that it's undemocratic? And my answer to that is, it's not. The function of this object, the main function, is actually to tell a story, to make the viewer see this piece and understand something about their own leather objects, to go home and sit on their own leather couch or sit on, see their own shoes with new eyes and really understand something about their objects. So it's a piece of communication which, like a good story, works without you having to own it. This was my first her. This is Eileen, Belinda, Carla, um, Elsa and Radia in the front here. I sometimes get asked why the cows don't have heads. Um, the reason for this is that uh, when a cow gets slaughtered, the head gets cut off and the feet get cut off. So when I recreate, when I use the hide to recreate the form of the animal, it will be without the head and without the legs. So when you communicate through objects, the materials become the words and the design becomes the syntax. And the objects don't have to make the detour um, to language. So basically, if I speak about objects and use objects, it stays very close to, to the subject. Um, with this piece that's uh, called the Snow White brooches, I wanted to investigate what language does to, um, to kind of generalize. Basically, mice have always been really important animals for people. They used to be um, the real animals that you kill in your kitchen. Um, we used to have this very direct connection with the real animal. Nowadays, um, most forms in which we encounter mice in our daily life are cartoons, or um, we, we call our partner mouse, or we somehow have created this anthropomorphized um, version of a mouse that, that really doesn't have much to do with the original an animal. Um, so I wanted to make a project about this, and I started with snake food. Um, in the UK, you're not allowed to breed your own mice if you have a snake, because the snake can't kill the mice humanely. Of course not. Um, so you have to actually buy shock-frozen baby mice um, to feed your snake. So I went to a pet shop and bought a, a pack of snake food, 
and I cast it. And out of these casts, I made these quite kitsch brooches, basically, by um, transforming the object from, um, through the making process from one side of the spectrum of mouseness to the exact opposite, to quite a kitsch, cartoony mouse. Mm. The question about the animal didn't leave me. I wanted to be a vet when I was a child, so I think it's always been there, this connection. Um, it didn't leave me after the um, cow bench and the mice. And I thought, there is still something I'm missing. And I figured out that what I'm missing is, I'm still looking at the death of the animal to be this divisive point between the animal and the object. But if we see a dead cow, we have all the emotions, almost all the emotions we have for the living cow, we, we still have for this dead cow. So somewhere in the process, later, our emotions fade and our emotions go. So I decided to investigate and I went to a knacker yard where they get animals that die in the field of natural causes and that have to be burned because they can't enter the food chain. And uh, we went through the slaughtering process to see when our emotions leave us and there is one moment when we take all the organs out of the animal and um, then we cut it into steaks, into, into ribs, into slices. So that one moment there is a void Within the, within the body of the animal that um, doesn't exist before or afterwards. And for me, that's a moment of transformation. So I decided to cast that void, um, because at the same time, it's a void, it's a shape that's totally similar to the shape that exists in all of us, which I found amazing that nobody's ever shown this shape, although we all have one, and it somehow um, resonates as well. It looks like something we've seen a million times but we've never seen it. So it's quite interesting that we have an emotional response to this. Um, Alessandro Mendini heavily criticized me for this object. He said, if this goes into the design books, it's a very sad moment of design, and it's cynical, and why would you make an object, an aesthetic object, around um, the death, the last breath of a dead animal, and it's really just horrible. It's really, uh, how can you exploit this? And my response to him was... Um, this is what we do every day. The only thing I've done is I've taken something we condone every day and brought it back closer to the origin of the animal, which is then what really shocks people because I'm moving it, I'm kind of, I'm stepping over that boundary to the moment when we still have this emotion. I also asked him the question is, um, is an object with the death of an animal as its starting point more ethical if it hides that this is its starting point? It doesn't actually make it more ethical for me. Um, he understand, understood, by the way, I got a handwritten letter and a bronze sculpture from him afterwards. <laughs> um, this is my husband standing by Detifos, um, an amazing waterfall in Iceland. And for me, this is, I think, how we should see ourselves more often. We are this being on the planet. We should be much more humble. We, we kind of deal with the planet like we are the, its rulers and we can control everything and we can't. And I think this trying to kind of feel how our position or that this is our position will enable us to do the next step to actually live in that way as well. If you stand by this spot, you just feel really amazed and really humble at the same time. You just see that there is a power that um, is much bigger than us. Um, I went to Japan. I think I'm running out of time quite quickly. I went to Japan um, to speak about man and marine life, about the overfishing of oceans and how we sustain ourselves from the ocean. Um, and I came with the idea of um, using some of the tuna, the bluefin tuna that gets fished in the Mediterranean, as a metaphor to actually start discussing about this and to make an object that raises debate. I ended up making um, a 90 square meter installation out of old boxes from the fish market that people could walk through, like they walk, like the tuna fish uh, walk, no, they don't walk, um, swim through the Almadrava, the traditional tuna trap, and end in this round room that signifies both the cradle of the fish um, and um, the net that pulls up the fish that's made of the boxes of fish roe. My idea with this was actually, for one, I saw again a material that is not valued, and I thought, there is so much value in it. This material, these boxes have so much inert value that is not being seen, it's being thrown away. So I want to use design to show that. 
And the other thing was that I wanted to create a moment with this piece um, that people could actually start discussing these thoughts. Um, currently, I'm uh, engaged into a PhD at the Royal College of Art, and I'm developing seaweed as a design material. Um, it's one of the things I found when I was researching in Japan. It's called kombu. And I think this, for me, could be a fantastic case study to, to show you what I mean. Um, basically, the seaweed is being eaten in Japan, but there, is, there are types of seaweed, of brown algae, around the British Isle, around Iceland, around northern Europe, um, that could be used just as well. And I'm trying to develop it into a design material. So I started with um, re-soaking it and stretching it around forms and pressing it and started creating these elements. And again, I see a value in this material that is not really being um, exploited yet or explored yet. Because for me, it could be a solution for fishing villages that have lost their fish stock, stock. And there are a lot of kind of northern English or Icelandic villages that where you really think, wow, what do they have? What could they use? There's a lot of seaweed on the beach and nobody actually does much with it. If we could transform this into veneers, into this is I can just only show part of it of the exploration, but into all kinds of design materials um, and create value from this, uh, it would be wonderful. This piece I made, it's a seaweed veneer that I made with the Deutsche Werkstätten in Hellerau and they do a lot of um, yacht interiors of millionaires and um, they still use a lot of mahogany veneer and this kind of old traditional luxuries. But I'd like to propose seaweed veneer as a new luxury. As I'd, I'd love to have um, this conversation of two yacht owners where one says, oh, what, what did you make your interior in? And the other one says, oh, mahogany. Really? That's so the last century. <laughs> it's seaweed now, isn't it? <laughs> um, and here we're together with some... Um, Urushi craftsmen, some Japanese craftsmen, to bring together the Urushi, the traditional Japanese lacquer, with what I propose could be the new um, Japanese traditional material, which is a beautiful veneer made of seaweed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. First one question from Twitter. Mm -hmm. Someone asked, have you ever been to a Dutch slaughterhouse? Because they use everything of really? the cows. So, oh, okay. I would love to. You yeah. would love to. <laughs> <laughs> to <hear that. laughs> Another thing, I think, um, well, uh, your, your work is quite provocative in, in the eyes of some people. But is this your intention, to be, to be provocative? I think the, the shock, there is a shock moment. But I think it's more the result rather than the attention. I think um, because I take the material out of its normal context and because, because I find its normal context is restrictive mm -hmm. because its normal context doesn't value it enough. So I have to take it out of this normal context to place it somewhere else where we can actually see what's happening. I.e. if I were to um, stay in the kitchen with the stomachs, I would have to kind of make new recipes but people would never get over this oh but it's a stomach and mm -hmm. I don't really... And, eat it with kind of their teeth bared and stuff. So I deliberately step outside of this context and there is a moment of fooling in a way because people don't expect this material in the context. Yeah. But the fooling happens because I want them to um, see it without the baggage that society gives them, without the value that society places or the non-value that society places yeah. on the object. That's someone, something else than being provocative. It's more like a humble way of... of, of of designing, I think. Humble towards nature. Yeah, I think it's more, I think it's giving the object the credit it deserves in my eyes. I think um, if we as a society don't place value on that stomach, I mean, it's, it's an amazing material. It's made by the sheep. Mm -hmm. The sheep has lived and died for us to have it. We as a society have to value it. I think there is something, there's no way around it. So... So it's more giving credit to that, yeah. Okay. The, 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 the public that, that knows your work is the public that visits galleries. I mean, it's, it's an elite in a way. Did you ever think of, of ways to, 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 to address your ideas to, to a larger public, to a mm. larger crowd? It's actually working really well because it's been publicized all mm. over the world, all across demographic boundaries. It's been like everywhere. So in a way, there might people who don't go to a museum might not actually see the object, but they see it in the magazine, and they actually see it 
because it's written there that it's design. It says the cow bench, the sofa by Julia Lohmann. You have the ability with design to enter people's living room. You can enter their lives through the back door. You can um, get much closer than you could ever get. If it said the sculpture, people would be like, oh, crazy sculpture, and not yeah. even put it into context with their life. But because they said it's design, people immediately think, how, how do I watch television on it? How do I, you know, where, where do you lean? It, it, <laughs> design has the ability of getting close to people's lives and in, imminently. And, and in that way, it's more like an aesthetical thing than a political thing, maybe? Uh, no, it's, it, is political, it is political, but it needs the aesthetics to actually... Um, that's a vehicle, basically. It needs, it needs to be beautiful for people to see it and for people to print it and for people to look at it. But then underneath there are layers of meaning. So I think that's another thing. It, it has various access points. It has really simple, really mm -hmm. easy access points. You can, if children see the cow bench, for example, they just run up to it and scratch it and yeah. pat it and see it as an animal. But then the more you think about it, more layers of meaning reveal themselves. So you can almost see it and then it stays with you and you can reflect on it. No. Or not, if you don't want. Well, it stays with me. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Ms. You. Julia Lohmann, thank you so much. We will have a coffee break from 25 minutes and after that coffee break we, uh, we will go again. But there's two breakout sessions. If you have the feeling I've been sitting long enough in this chair, uh, I want to do something else, I want to interact, there's two sessions you can choose.